Mexican football star Chucky Lozano went down with a pretty concerning looking injury. And in this video, I'm going to break down kind of what's going on in the field and what we do in terms of kind of medical management in these types of situations. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Dr. Brian Suter, and this is your number one source for learning about the unique medical side of the world of sports. Let's get right to the play where this happened. You guys know what to do if you want to help support this channel. So here, as we can see, of course, there's no real mystery. Lozano got bumped. And as he's falling down here, the goalkeeper comes out and we see Lozano's head get hit backwards into a pretty concerning extreme position in terms of excessive range of motion. When we talk about movement of the neck, extension is when we look up, and then flexion is when we bend our chin down. Lateral rotation is in when we look to the right or look to the left. As Lozano's head gets bent here, it goes into hyper or excessive extension backwards as well as with some lateral rotation over his right shoulder. When you have this much excessive motion, not only are you potentially stretching compressing, injuring the spinal cord, but the bones in the joints, like we'll look at here in a minute in the spine, can only move so far. And so when you excessively move them past their normal range of motion, you run the risk of fractures of those bones. The next thing I want to address is if you're in a situation like this, don't try to move the person or roll the person over, especially if you're at a game like this where you've got medical coverage right there. Sometimes we see players, they're concerned, they want to do the best they can, and so they try to roll the athlete over or, or do something because of these fears of things like choking on your tongue, which are not founded at all. So in a situation like this, do what this player is doing. Protect the athlete who's down from getting hit more and wait for the medical team to get out there before you try to move them. Now, when we get out there as the medical team, the first thing we're doing is just roughly trying to determine their level of alertness or if they're conscious. Taking a few seconds, rubbing them, shaking them on the shoulder like they're doing here, trying to see if they're responding. Here in this situation, he clearly wasn't responding. So we know that he had a positive loss of consciousness. The next thing we do in our trauma evaluation there on the field is going to be walk through our A, B, C, D, E's. A is airway, B is breathing, and C is circulation. And you'll notice these are the first things we think about before we even worry about an injury to the neck or the spinal cord. That's because those are what's crucial for life. And so we check to see if they have a good airway, if they're breathing, and then we check a pulse to make sure there's no cardiac arrest like we unfortunately saw with Christian Erickson. Once we go through those first ABCs, then we get to D, which is disability. And that's where we worry about our neurologic exam and potential spinal cord injury. In this case, when we have an athlete who's completely unconscious, we assume the worst. We assume that there's an injury to the spinal cord and we treat it as such. That's because the assessment relies on them giving proper answers to questions and proper feedback and participating in an exam. If the athlete's unconscious, we can't really trust what they're saying or doing to be accurate, so we assume the worst, we want to be as safe as possible, and we treat this as if they have a neck injury with stabilizing the spine, getting them on a backboard, getting them to the hospital. E is then environmental exposures. So is there anything in the environment, like if somebody is down in a lake or something on their clothes, like a burn, something that could be worse in the environment, then we address that only after we address that disability. Now, when we talk about possible injuries here, certainly concussion, because we know he lost consciousness. You looked like there was some bleeding kind of above his eye, probably just from here when the shoe kind of grazed up past him as this was following through. But then of course we worry about injury to the neck or the cervical spinal cord. Keep in mind this position of hyperextension with the neck bent backwards and over to the right. When we look at our biodigital anatomy tool here, I've shown the bones of the cervical spine as well as the spinal cord running through it. And then the little nerve roots where the nerves exit the spinal cord to go out to the body. We have these tiny little joints in the back of our spine on both sides called the facet joints. Those joints help our neck to spin and rotate, but also limit the amount of normal range of motion that we have. In a position where the neck is extremely extended or bent backwards, we put a lot of load and compression on these facet joints. And then if you add in some twisting, there's risk of fracturing those joints, dislocating those joints, and having significant injury to the bones of the spinal cord. So that's the first piece that we think about with actual bony fractures. But then the spinal cord itself runs in this little tunnel down between those bones of the spine. With that excessive movement, you can actually stretch or compress the spinal cord, almost like when you bruise a muscle or bruise a bone. So even if the spinal cord is not torn or cut, you can still have a spinal cord injury just from excessive stretch or compression of the spinal cord. We also have to realize that these nerves exit the spine through these tiny little holes called the neuroforamen. And so depending on how the neck is positioned and twisted, you can get pinching and injury of just the spinal nerves, not actually the spinal cord itself. So at the hospital, then that's what they're really gonna focus on here. CT scan to look at the integrity of the bones and evaluate for a fracture. 
MRI to look at the health of the spinal cord and the nerves, and then hopefully be able to repeat a better neurologic exam. This is certainly great at the end. We at least see that he's grossly moving that right arm. You know, I don't see him move the legs or that right arm, but we at least see some movement in that left arm. It looked like he was conscious two positive things at least before ultimately getting to the hospital. So hopefully we get a good update in terms of his status and condition here, but I hope this was educational to talk about some of the anatomy of the spine and kind of that sequence of what we're going through in terms of evaluating an athlete down on the field in a situation like this. Let me know as always any questions or comments down below and until next time, we'll see you later.